uh, stand with them as they go down. We're going to look at one more song tonight, 428 in your hymnals. I need thee every hour, 428. We'll do all verses tonight, but lift it up with us as we sing that this evening. I need thee every hour. faithful about that. You guys can go ahead and be seated. Thank you. Amen. I'm going to have Bryce come. He's got some things to tell you about. Actually, I'd like to keep him here. He puts more enthusiasm into things he's promoting than I ever could. And so I, if you'll let me keep him, I'll just use him for that. Be okay? okay. <laughs> All, right. All right. Thank you, Pastor. Okay, well, tonight I want to tell you a little story. Um, several weeks ago, there was I was finishing my presentation, and the pastor and my dad were sitting over here on the, on the, on the platform, and uh, the pastor leaned over to my dad and said something. Well, and then they began to laugh, and I thought, uh-oh, okay, what did I say? You know, what did I mess up on? And I didn't find out till the next night what he said. He said this, you know, you got to start somewhere in order to be a used car salesman. And talking about uh, being a better salesman, I was told that if I sold the, if I uh, presented these CDs with a guarantee of a uh, of a, a signing of them, like if you bought it, we would sign it. That was that was the guarantee. All right. So if you're interested in that, these are ten dollars there on our back table. Uh, also, ask you a question tonight: What are the ten most powerful words in the Bible? Think about it. What are the ten most powerful words in the Bible? Well, according to Paul Chappell, Chappell the answer is found in Philippians 4.13, which says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. We also have a book entitled, I'm Not Okay. It's about defeating the root of pride and discovering God's grace. These are $5, and if you're interested in any of that, along with the calendars on the back table, Stop by the back table, and I'll try and help you as best I can. Right. Notice I put him right before his dad. Now, you're on the spot, brother. <laughs> Come give us God's word. Amen. Amen. Thank you, preacher. If you have your Bibles, would you turn with me to John chapter 13. John chapter 13. All the children that want to be a part of the kids program, you'll follow my wife and kids out the door They'll be having their thing tonight 
and tomorrow night. So make sure that you participate in that if you desire. And uh, they'll have a great time, I know that. Well, this is a great crowd. And today, today we got introduced to Tim's. Tim's Donuts. Praise God. Amen. That is a discovery that all mankind should find out. Amen. And uh, now I don't know if it's just coincidence, but this morning's chapel message was skinny is out and fat is in. Amen. I tell you what, that was the way to coordinate it. I'll tell you what, those donuts did not last very long. Uh, Pastor Rick brought them in and said, hey, we want you to, uh, we want you to encounter something this morning. And anytime it's in a donut box, I'm usually very a happy camper. And I brought them to the, the, to the trailer. And within about, oh, I don't know, five minutes, I think they were all consumed. All right. So we, we definitely like that flavor. That's good stuff right there. We could probably eat quite a few of those, to be honest with you, but uh, we shouldn't, amen, uh, even though I preach skinny is out and fat is in, you'll have to ask the young people what it was about, all right, but anyways, we have had a great time this week, and thank you, thank you for coming and being a part of a great crowd tonight, and we got one more night, one more night tomorrow night, and so hey, be a part of it, and if you want to be here tomorrow morning, 8 o'clock, we're having our morning service with young people. And uh, I think it's been a help to them, and I've had people tell me that, and so I'm thankful for that opportunity. But tonight, let's look into the Word of God one more time. Would you stand with me out of respect of reading God's Word? John chapter 13, verse 31 is where we're going to pick up the reading. We've said this week, our job is to reestablish truth in our lives. We talked about reestablishing the truth of the work that it takes to raise a godly generation last night. And, and the night before, we, we talked about different things through the week that were going to help us not fall to the deception of the enemy. And we know that the only thing that really will eliminate that is if we reestablish truth in our life. Well, let's look at the Word of God tonight and see the truth we're going to find. Look what the Bible says in verse 31. Therefore, when he, Judas, was gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straightway glorify him. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. Ye seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, whether I go, ye cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. Look at verse 35. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Tonight I'd like to preach a message I've entitled, The Love of Christ. Tonight, I'd like to show you right from this text three attributes of the love of Christ. But before we get started, can we ask God to give us a hand? Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. Lord, your love that you've demonstrated for us. And Father, as we look into the word of God here tonight, would our hearts be touched? For Father, we're reestablishing the truth of the love of Christ that you have for us. And Father, we'll thank you and praise you for what you're going to do in the invitation time. In Jesus, my precious Savior's name, amen. You may be seated. Church family, I believe that Jesus was probably the greatest teacher that ever walked on this planet. You say, well, why do you say that? Well, I find that Jesus always sees the opportunity to teach a timeless truth. I, I told some of you before, I, I have seven classes I teach every day. I teach all the Bible, science, and math to my four children. And then I have my sister's four. And I used to have a couple others, and we do it all through FaceTime. And so pretty much from 9 o'clock in the morning to about 1 in the afternoon, I, I teach and and uh, I teach all different types of classes. And uh, there's times in when you're a teacher that they just don't get it. You know what I'm saying, Brother Corey? I mean, it, it, it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter how you say it. It doesn't matter how you bring it out in an example form. It, it, it's as if the setting isn't right and they just don't get it. Well, there was this time where... 
in evangelism, we're starting our 10th year in January, we've had two dogs, two dogs. And uh, they've both been Shih Tzus, like Mrs. Mitchell's dog back there. And uh, we had two of them. One of them ran away. That didn't help much. But the other one, her name was Cookie. And you know how it goes, mom and dad. Your girls come to you and they say, dad. They bat their eyes. I want a puppy. Now, first thing we should do, men, is turn away. That's what we ought to do. But since we're sensitive 90s type of guys, we look. Oh, and then they say this. This is the one that gets us. Dad, if I get a puppy, I will become more responsible. That's a lie. <laughs> but we listen with both ears, content. And we're thinking, would this be the trick that turns the corner and they become more responsible? Our hopes are driven high. Then we get the dog. And for two weeks, boy, oh boy, do they do their job. I mean, they take the dog out, they feed the dog, they water the dog, they play with the dog, and everything is good for a 14-day period. And then day 15 comes. And it's not new anymore. Then all of a sudden, the dog starts doing things to flooring that should never be done. <laughs> to flooring. And they start chewing on things that were never intended to be chewed on. You know what I'm saying? And as a parent who lives in a 38-foot box with six people, there are times of frustration. Why? Because you have things on the floor that never were intended to be on the floor. You have pieces of furniture that have marks on them that were never intended to have marks on. You have hairballs everywhere where you never thought hairballs should be. And there's times where you want to open up that two-foot door of your trailer and just punt that dog perfectly through to score three points for you. You know what I'm talking about. You've been there. And so one day, we were down in Georgia, and it was a morning time, and one of the girls was taking Cookie out. And so sure enough, she went out, and she went and did her business in the morning, and then all of a sudden, Cookie found a squirrel. Now, Cookie could have never caught a squirrel even if he was only had three legs. He was so big. She was so big. But they think it's the world's greatest game of tag. And so, man, here comes the squirrel, and the squirrel gets Cookie's att her attention, and, man, now it's on. It is on, man. The Cookie thinks that she is going to get that squirrel. Not a chance. But anyways, she thinks she's got a chance. And so, man, there goes the squirrel darting back and forth through the trees and all this way. And then all of a sudden, the squirrel crosses the road. So what does Cookie do? Crosses, well, attempts to cross <laughs> the road. And you know what? Cookie didn't make it. And my girls cried, said, Dad, Dad. And so I darted out of the trailer. And there I saw a Cookie laying on the road. And I grabbed Cookie up in my arms. And there she took her last breath. And do you know who was crying like a baby? You're looking at him. But you know what we learned that day? Here it is. The value of life. I went back into the trailer and I said, kids, listen up. You know, there were times where dad wanted to punt this dog. 
There was, one of the, there was times where I just wanted to kind of leave it at the church and drive off. And let it be a church dog, okay? He needs it. She needs it. But you know what? Right now, every single one of us is weeping like a baby. You know why? Because the setting was just perfect to understand the principle that was being taught. Do you know what we find in John chapter 13? In the first 30 verses, there's a guy by the name of Judas. You know what Judas is just about to do? He's just about to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Not much. But in those 30 verses, Jesus, the Bible describes for us the betrayal of one of Jesus' disciples. Now understand, there's only 12 of them. Jesus handpicked 12 guys to personally follow him. We might say it in the text language today that Judas was one of his BFs, his best friends. Why? Because he was right there and he did a lot of things with him. Matter of fact, he was in charge of the money bag and he was able to go and he was able to do different things and see different things. And he was one of the guys that in just a little bit was going to stab Jesus in his back. Then at the end of the last, this chapter, the last, I don't know, four or five verses, you know what we're given to? There's a man by the name of Peter. We would call him maybe a BFFL. You say, what are you talking about? Best friend for life. Why? Because there was only three that got to go on the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter, James, and John. You know what the Bible says? That before the cock would crow three times, that this man named Peter would deny Christ three times. And sandwiched in between a betrayal and a denial, you know what Jesus is about to teach his boys? About the love of Christ. You see, it's easy to love people when they love you. But Jesus has the perfect setting. He seizes the opportunity to teach a timeless truth between a betrayal and a denial. And come with me tonight and let me show you three attributes about the love of Christ. Notice with me verse 34. Look what the Bible says in verse 34. The Bible says, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you. The first attribute of the love of Christ is number one, it is redemptive. Would you say that with me? It is redemptive. One more time, it is redemptive. Now, the word, the root word is redeemed. The Bible says, a new commandment I've given you that you love one another as I have loved you. You see, Jesus showed His redemptive love on the cross of Calvary. You know, the cross is a beautiful picture of the redemptive love of Jesus Christ. You say, what are you talking about? Well, for us that are married, we we at the uh, uh, the marriage ceremony... We exchange rings. And and, and when you exchange that ring, you you get that wedding ring placed uh, on your left hand. You now see a symbol of that person's endless love for you. That, that's what this is supposed to mean. This, this is what it represents. It's, it's a picture of my endless love for you and, and, and that this is what I want for you. I want to love you the rest of my life. And so this is a, somehow that I want to prove that love to you. I want to show that love to you. Now watch, watch, watch. You know what the cross is? The cross is a beautiful picture, just like the wedding ring, 
of the redemptive love of Jesus Christ. John 15, 13. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for a friend. Ephesians chapter 1, verse number 7. In whom we have redemption. There's the word. Through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Listen to me. It's only through the blood of Jesus Christ. Do you understand that? It's only through his blood that you can have your sins forgiven. Hebrews chapter 9, verse number 12. Neither by the blood of goats or calves. Now come with me. Come with me. Back in the Old Testament, you know what you would do? If you committed sin, if you had sin in your life, you would bring a sacrifice, a blood sacrifice, an animal. You would bring them to the priest. And the priest would slit his throat. And what they would do is they would pour the, the blood upon the altar. Now watch what that does. And what that blood would represent is a covering of your sin, not a cleansing. But the Bible says in Hebrews 9, verse, or Hebrews 9, 12, neither by the blood of goats or calves, but by his own blood, he entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. You know what that tells me, preacher? That tells me this, hey, I can't lose it. Why? Because that payment did it for eternity. Praise God that when Jesus Christ went to the cross, God said, hey, that'll do it for all of mankind. And all they have to do is trust in God's blood that it can wash away your sin. And that alone, that's why Acts 16, 31 is so powerful. It says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's why Acts 13, 38 says, hey, be it known unto you, men and brethren, through this man is preached the forgiveness of sin. You see, it's only through the blood of Jesus Christ that you can have your sins forgiven. And if you don't, you say, you know what, I don't want that. That's you, preacher. That's the Baptist thing. No, it isn't. It's the Bible thing. That's, that's for you, preacher, but if that's not for me, then listen, listen. Somebody's got to pay for your sin. Somebody has to. You say, well, where do you find that in the Bible? Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death. Someone's got to pay for it. So either you can pay for it in a like of fire for eternity or you can receive Christ's redemptive love to pay for it and have your sins forgiven. Doesn't make any sense at all, does it? But you know what, Pastor King? I meet people every single day that reject his redemptive love. You know what he says in the text? He says this, a new commandment I give to you, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Wow. You see, there's a lot of people that say the cheap words, hey, I love you. But they're just words. When does it become truth? When the action is shown. But God commended or wanted to demonstrate his love towards us. And that while we are yet sinners, get this, Christ died for us. You know what that proves to me? He just didn't say it. He meant it. Why? Because of the cross. No, long, no longer, the Bible says, you're no longer your own. You've been bought with a price. The price of my precious Savior's blood. But notice the second attribute. Look with me at verse 34 again. It says, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye, notice what it says, that, that, that ye also love one another. Well, the second attribute of the love of Christ, not only is it redemptive, but number two, it's reciprocal. Would you say that with me? It's reciprocal. One more time. It's reciprocal. Now, how many of you have a reciprocal saw at home? How many of you know what a reciprocal saw is? All right. Sawzall is another name for it. All right. Now, there's a difference between a circular saw and a reciprocal saw. 
All right, now, a circular saw, let me help you out here, is not for cutting circles, okay? Now, if you try, you might be missing something, okay, when you're done, all right? The reason why it's called a circular saw is the motion of the blade, all right? The motion of the blade, when you pull a circular saw, it goes in a circle, all right? And so it's good for cutting straight lines. Don't try circles. It just doesn't work well, all right? And so that's what you cut. You can cut plywood. You can cut two-by-fours. You can cut a lot of things with a circular saw, but it's not for circles. But on a reciprocal saw, the motion of the blade is not circular. For what happens in a reciprocal saw is it goes out and then back in. It goes out and then back in. Now, this is a great tool for demolition, okay? If you love demo day, hey, this tool is for you. You can do some serious damage quickly with a sawzall. You just can, you know? It's great for plumbing. Uh, you could do some electrical stuff with it, but really, you would never use this doing trim work, okay? At least I wouldn't. Maybe you would, but that, that wouldn't be my first choice uh, on a tool that I would select for doing trim work, all right? But, but, this saw does its job. And let me tell you, when it goes back out, it comes back in every single time. Now listen to what Jesus says. As you have received the redemptive love of Jesus Christ, got it? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to love one another. As you have received love from one another, here we go, I want you to love another. Do you see the motion? It's back and forth. It's back and forth. Now watch, watch, watch. Here's the problem. We love in order to get. You say, what are you talking about, preacher? How many of you have grandkids? All right. They're going to be able, you're going to be able to relate with this, all right? So let's say that Johnny comes over to Grandma's house, Mama, Mamma, Grammy, whatever your name is, okay? And sometimes you may not know your name. But anyways, but he comes over to Grammy's house, and Johnny's talking to Grammy. and says, Grammy, I tell you what, you make the best chocolate chip cookies in the world. I'm telling you what, Grammy, I love your chocolate chip cookies. Well, let me tell you. Grammy's loving this, all right? Grammy can sit, you could talk like to this to Grammy all day long. You know, she's onto this, you know? And so she's like, oh, stop, Johnny, stop it, stop it, Johnny. And Johnny's adding on, man, I tell you, I don't know who this Betty Crocker is. I don't know who Nestle is. I don't know who Oreos are. But let me tell you, Grammy, you ought to make a factory. These are the best chocolate chip cookies in the world. And he just goes on and on and on and on. Well, then, after he finishes waxing so elephantly, he sits over here in the corner and kind of puts on his poochy lip and Grammy notices Johnny's a little upset. So Grammy looks over at Johnny and says, hey, what's wrong, Johnny? Oh, nothing. No, Johnny, what, what's wrong? Oh, nothing, nothing. Johnny, what's wrong? Well, Grammy, if you really want to know, I'm not doing so well. Why's that, Johnny? Well, Grammy, I would be doing so much better if I had a new PlayStation 4. <laughs> Grammy looks over at Butch. Hey, Butch, get up. Come on. We're going to go to Toys R Us and get Johnny a, a PlayStation 4. Now watch, watch. We all laugh at that. But the truth is, that's what we think love is. You know what's sad? Johnny doesn't stop doing that to Grammy. He doesn't stop doing that to his wife. We don't stop doing that to one another. And you know what? This is the sad part. We start thinking that's what the love of Christ is. Why? Because you're bombarded with that thought. Everywhere you go, you think of the love of Christ and you think, oh, this has got to be it. We love in order to get. No, 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 no. That is not the love of Christ. The love of Christ is the love in order to give, not get. Because here's the base. What did he get from you?
He didn't. But the love of Christ is reciprocal. And we love not just, we love in order to get, and he loved in order. Here's another one. Oh, here's a great one, classic one. Oh, preacher, I know what it is. We love, love is just a feeling. Really. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Keep your finger here. We're going to come back to it. But I want to disprove that. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. This is the great love chapter of the Bible. If you really want to know what the love of Christ is, hey, memorize this thing. But look with me, look with me in verse number four. Charity, which is the same word as love. Charity suffereth long and is kind. Now, wait, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. You just jumped out of context. What? What? Wait a minute, what's happening in John 13? This man by the name of Judas, his BF, has decided to betray him. We could say it this way, he decided to throw him under the bus. His BFFL, Peter, has denied him. We could say today's lingo, he has stabbed him in the back. Now here's my question, when you have that done to you, What's your feelings? I'll tell you what most of our feelings is, anything but love. I know what most of our feelings is. Hey, we'll just put it in reverse and back them over, back over them in the bus. It's got nothing to do with love. But listen to what love is. Love suffereth long. Love is is kind. Now watch. Why is that? Because the love of Christ is different than what we think of love today because we are bombarded. We are bombarded with the Hollywood's love. We're bombarded with Hallmark 30 days. Look out, here it comes. Just swallow a pill or do something, all right? They're all the same. And we're gonna start watching and we're gonna like, oh. It's so loving. Oh, I tell you what. Oh. And then we're going to start thinking, hey, that's what the love of Christ is. No, no, no. Here's the problem. That's not the love of Christ. Why? Because his love isn't based on our performance. And you better get that. See, husbands, you're commanded in Ephesians chapter 5, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Do you understand that that love is unconditional love, not based upon her performance to you? It's not. You say, why is that? Because that's exactly what Christ's love for us is. See, you can't change his love for you. You know why? Because agape love is not based upon our performance. You see, here's what we do. We say it this way, I'll love her if she loves me like we're in third grade. But if she doesn't love me, she doesn't show me that love, she doesn't give me that physical attention, she doesn't do this, she doesn't do that, then you know, I'm just telling you, I ain't gonna love her. Wait a minute, wait a minute. That's not the love of Christ. That would be inconsistent. That would be based upon my performance. And if the love of Christ is based upon Jake DeAndre's performance to God, I'm in serious shape. But that's what's so amazing. That the love of Christ 
isn't based upon Jake DeAndre's performance to him. That's why, that's why it's so amazing. That's why when you start scratching the, the depth of the love of Christ, you find that it's an inexhaustible. That's why that Paul says in Ephesians chapter 3, hey, if you want to strengthen the inner man, you know what you need to do? You need to go start getting your measuring tape out and measure the depth and the height and the width and the length of the love of Christ. And you know what you're going to find? It's immeasurable. You better get a long tape measure because you're going to need it. And that's what strengthens the inner man. Why? Because it's contrary to how we've been brought up in what we know. And be honest with you, Pastor Rick, we haven't seen it. Let's just get honest. You say, we haven't seen it? Yeah. When's the last time you've seen that kind of love? When's the last time? When are these young people right here when have they seen a husband love his wife not based upon her performance? When? So then it looks like I have just fallen off the bandwagon. All right? He just didn't take his medicine tonight. He'll be all right in the morning. No, no. It's exactly what Jesus is saying. He's saying, hey, as you have received that redemptive love of Jesus Christ. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to love one another. But preacher, you don't know what Anthony did to me. Yeah, you're right. But watch. What'd you do to Christ? Oh yeah, that's right. Your sin nailed him to him, the cross. That's right. Good call. Good call. What did he do for you? He loved you. Come on, give me the excuse you're going to tell me why you can't love that person. I want to hear it. No, 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 better yet, tell God. You know what he's going to say? You're right, you're right. Watch. You know what your sin did to me? It nailed me to the cross. You know what I did? I stayed there. And I shed my blood. So you wouldn't have to spend eternity in hell. Now, you know all I've asked? Would you love that person? Would you show the back and forth movement as, as I have loved you? Would you love one another? As, but preacher, you don't know what... Stop making the excuses because there's not going to be an excuse that's going to be good enough. Just go back to seeing what Jesus did for you on the redemptive cross of Calvary. Get number three. Genesis, John chapter 13, verse 35. Look what the Bible says. Turn back to John chapter 13. He says it this way. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples. The third attribute we're going to look at tonight Number one, it's redemptive. Number two, it's reciprocal. But number three, get this one. It is reflective. Would you say that with me? It is reflective. One more time. It is reflective. Now, notice what Jesus says in verse 35. He says it this way. By this. So whatever the this is, it's going to reflect. It's going to uh, uh, tell us it's going to uh, uh, it's it's going to be the trademark of who his disciples are. Would we all agree with that? Would we agree? Trademarks are pretty significant, aren't they? We went outside and and we went down truck row. All right, and all the grills of the truck were facing us, and we looked and we saw the first truck was. A truck that had a bow tie on the front of the grill. Class, what kind of truck would that be? Chevy, all right, good. Hey, it, it, if it had two ram's horns, what would it be, class? All right, you're getting better. You should get this one. If there's a blue oval that says F-O-R-D, what would it be, class? All right, see, you're smarter than you look. All right, good, good. 
But no one had to say, you know what, I've got to go up to the VIN number and just check this out. VH17ZZTAL15QR112. Hey, that's a Ford. That's a Ford. I'll tell you what, I got it. All right. No one, no one said, hey, let me see the title. Uh, okay. Rick Salazar, Ford, this blah, 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 does it? No. What'd you do? You saw the trademark. And what did it do? It initially told you what kind of vehicle it was. You didn't have to say, well, let's see. I think, no. You, you saw the trademark and it told you exactly what it was. And we went to tractor and we, we all of a sudden came to the tractor world and, and we saw this green and yellow tractor glass. What kind of tractor would it be? Hey, we, we don't even have to ask, do we? Okay, and we could go through the tractor land and we could identify, why? Because those colors are trademarks to that brand. Now Jesus says this, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples. Who are truly my followers of me? Notice what he says that ye have love one to another. Notice what it doesn't say. Notice what it doesn't say. How big your Bible is. Your haircut. Your dress. I'm not anti all that, and there's right place for those. Notice what it doesn't say. Your love for God. Uh Uh-oh. Is there something wrong with the Bible? Doesn't say that, does it? What does it say? By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples by your love for one another. Say, preacher, I don't get it. Why does it say that? Here it is, here it is. You wanna know why? How do you prove that you love God? Do you wear a little pin that says, hi, my name is Jake and I love God? Do you have a rolling LED screen that kind of scrolls through all the things that you've accomplished in your life? It says, hi, you know, Jake, and uh, you know, I'm an evangelist and I've been serving the Lord in this for 10 years and I love God. No, that's not how it works. So why? Here's why. In order for this relationship to be right, You know what I'm talking about? In order for your vertical relationship with God to be right, watch this, this is very, very important. You know what it must be right? This relationship. And if this relationship isn't right, then get it, this relationship is not right. And what we think is, well, preacher, you know what? I'm right with God, but you know what? I don't get along with my brother-in-law. I don't get along with my sister. I don't get along with my mom. I don't get along with my preacher. Hey, can I help you? You're not right with God. It's that simple. Well, preacher, you don't know what they, oh, really? We're gonna do this again? Thought we just went through this. But preacher, you don't understand. No, 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 I do. I do. You know why? Because I'm human too. And I can get my eyes distracted off of the truth just like every single one of us here tonight. But I'm telling you this, in order for this to be right, this has to be right. And if this is not right, then this is not right either. And here's what's amazing. Jesus says it so much better than Jake DeAndre will ever say it. He said, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples. By your love, one for another. Wow. Because you know what I find? People have all different types of ways to justify their unloving ways. But God says, you know what? Who are my true disciples? Those that are right this way and this way. 
tonight we got to make a choice. You say, well, preacher, you don't understand. I, I've been coming to this church for 35 years. Praise God for you. But I tell you what, if you're not right this way, even after being here for 35 years, you're not right with God this way. It's just what the Bible says. And what Jesus says is this is going to be the trademark. This is going to be what reflects to all men know that you're followers of me. Would you bow with me? Every head bowed, every eye closed. Church family, friends, teenagers, thank you for being here tonight. I've often wondered when preaching a message like this, if Jesus Christ came here tonight and he ran the invitation and asked this question, how many of you here tonight are my true disciples? You know, a hand isn't going to be that impressive to Jesus. Because Jesus can look right past your hand and he sees your heart. He sees your every attitude. He sees your every motive. He sees your every action. And so your hand is really insignificant to the, the answer to Jesus Christ's question. That he would ask tonight. But maybe you're here tonight and as I was speaking, the Holy Spirit was knocking on the door of your heart. Because if the truth be told, God has put that Holy Spirit to work in your heart. Because there's some individual, there's something that you haven't been loving towards. You have not been showing the love of Christ. It has not been reciprocal. And because of that, you know what? Your relationship with the Lord is being hindered. You say, well, preacher, that's a private matter. Hey, re revival will never happen unless we humble ourselves and seek his face and turn from his wicked ways. Maybe the Holy Spirit's speaking to your heart tonight and you say, preacher, would you pray with me that I would re respond to people in a more loving way? Oh, I know it's difficult. I've got a sin nature just like you. Preacher, would you pray with me that I would properly respond and show them the love of Christ like Christ showed to me on the cross of Calvary? Preacher, would you remember me in prayer? Hey, if that's you with every head bowed and every eye closed, but the Holy Spirit's working on your heart right this moment. You say, Preacher, that's me. Would you remember me? Just quietly lift your hand up in the air and say, Preacher, that's me. Thank you for your honesty. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hands, hands, and more hands. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. In just a moment, I'm going to pray. We're going to stand to our feet. Our heads are going to be bowed. Our eyes are going to be closed. The piano will begin. Hey, I'm going to challenge you. Would you come and do business with him tonight? Before I pray, I wonder if there's someone here that would say this. Preacher, I've never experienced the redemptive love of Jesus Christ. If I die, preacher, I don't know if I've ever had my sins forgiven. Hey, my friend, I'm going to say this, but I'm not saying it to scare you. I'm just telling you the fact to warn you. If you died and you've never had your sins forgiven, you will end up having to pay for them in a lake of fire. Cold hill, and I don't want that. Pastor Mitchell doesn't want that. Jesus Christ obviously doesn't want it. He went to the cross for you. But maybe you're here tonight and you say, Preacher, I don't really know if I've ever experienced that redemptive love of Jesus Christ. Preacher, would you... Remember me in prayer. Would you pray that I could experience that redemptive love of Jesus Christ? Hey, if that's you with every head bowed, every eye closed, that's a private decision. I'm not here to embarrass you. But you say, preacher, would you remember me in prayer? I want you to quietly raise your hand up in the air and say, preacher, that's me. I've never experienced the redemptive love of Jesus Christ. But preacher, I want to figure that out tonight. Preacher, would you remember me in prayer? Just quietly slip it up long enough for me to see it. And you put it right back down. Preacher, would you remember me? 
Would you, would you keep me in prayer, preacher? I really don't know if I died. If I've ever had my sins forgiven, preacher, would you remember me? Just slip it up long enough for me to see it. Put it right back down. Preacher, would you remember me in prayer? Church family, Christians, now it's time for us to respond. Would you not let the devil snatch away the good seed tonight? As we've reestablished the truth of the love of Christ. Father, it's amazing that you would do that for us. But Father, as we look into the word of God, you did. And many of us in this room have accepted that redemptive love. And now, Father, you've told us, as I have loved you, love one another. Father, would you help us? Would you give us the strength and the encouragement, the boldness, even to love those that we would say are unlovable. Father, you had the perfect setting to teach this timeless truth between a betrayal and a denial. And Father, would we stop making excuses and Lord, would we start using the truth to set us free. And Father, we'll thank you and praise you for what you're gonna do in this invitation. In Jesus, my precious Savior's name. Amen. Would you stand with me? Your heads are bowed. Your eyes are closed. The piano's begun. God, speak into your heart. Why don't you come right now? Right now. Don't look left. Don't look right. You come right now. You raised your hand. Preacher, that's me. Would you come? God, speak into your heart. He's knocking right now. Heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. The Holy Spirit, speak into your heart. Would you come now? Would you do business with God? Don't leave here the same way you left here. You came here. Don't, don't do that. Is God speaking to your heart tonight? Why don't you come? Why don't you make it right? Why don't you allow the truth to set you free? Would you come? Would you come? truth that's so often overlooked and yet that's what Jesus said so it's got to be right God's dealing with your heart there's still time for you to come Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Please be in prayer about t tomorrow night. It's Wednesday night, normal Wednesday night service. Uh, so there will be some others here, but we want God to deal with our hearts. Uh, last night of the revival meeting, hopefully it's the beginning of the revival. And so that's what we're, we're looking for. So uh, be in prayer about that tomorrow. Don't forget to see Rick if you can help with the uh, twos and threes tomorrow night. Uh, let him know about that. I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Gonzalez if he would dismiss us in prayer, please.